Okay, so in our last uh, lesson, last session, we, uh, if you remember, we took a kind of a side trip to look at a portion of Judah's life. Uh, Judah was uh, Jacob's fourth son. And if you remember correctly, I explained that the purpose of the story of Judah in chapter uh, 38 was to explain the background of Jesus' genealogy from Jacob through Judah. Um, so in today's lesson, the uh, narrative goes back to the main story. So you know, we were on a main story and then we took a side trip to, to, for a chapter to look at Judah and you know, how Jesus followed through him. Now we go back to Joseph, the 11th son of Jacob, and uh, how he fared uh, after being sold into slavery in Egypt. So the last time we saw Joseph, he had been transported to Egypt, was sold to a man named Potiphar, who was the king's captain and uh, captain of the guard and also the executioner. And uh, our chapter will begin to recount Joseph's experience in this uh, new country, this new situation. A lot of us are familiar with this uh, story. Uh, let's talk about ancient Egypt for a moment, shall we? Uh, Egypt, was already an old country by the time Joseph arrived in it. I mean, it's an ancient country now, but it was still an old country uh, 3,000 years ago. Um, it was a nation ruled by pharaohs. The word pharaoh means great house, great house. And the pharaohs uh, handed power down from gener generation to generation through family dynasties. That was the way they did it much like most monarchies, hand the power down through dynasties, family dynasties. Now scholars don't know for sure which pharaoh ruled when Joseph was there. The Bible only refers to him as the pharaoh, but pharaoh is a title, it's like king or something, it doesn't tell you which, which pharaoh uh, it was. Some believe that it was the Hyksos uh, dynasty, because these particular rulers were foreign kings that had conquered Egypt and they had a Semitic background. In other words, their family background was, you could trace them back to Shem, Noah's son, Abraham's ancestor. Uh, so this explains the favorable treatment that Joseph and his family received later on. Okay? Now in later centuries, these dynasties were forced out of power and they were replaced by purely Egyptian pharaohs, kings, which some people suggest may explain why Joseph's ancestors were subsequently treated harshly. They weren't family anymore. They weren't related anymore to the pharaoh, even in an indirect way. And of course, this was done because the descendants of Joseph may have been seen as distant relatives of foreign kings that were now expelled, so they didn't want to repeat of what had happened in the past. Foreign powers come in, overtake you know, the existing dynasty and so on and so forth. Anyway, some speculation on you know, why Joseph was uh, uh, well treated afterwards. Nevertheless, Joseph is in a pagan country that had very low moral standards and practiced uh, polytheism, which is the worship of many, many gods. So let's uh, go into the chapter itself. Begin reading chapter 39, uh, verse one. It says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he owned he put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all the, that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So Potiphar, it says here, was captain and chief executioner. Interesting, the word officer here means eunuch. 
He was a eunuch. Now at that time it was common in those days to castrate high officials to prevent them from interfering in the king's harem or staging some sort of military coup in order to begin a family dynasty of their own. Uh, so that was one way that they did it. Anybody who rose to high power, close to the you know, center of power, close to the pharaoh, was a eunuch. Potiphar uh, may have agreed to this, to reach high office after marriage, or his wife married him to reach a high social plateau without regard to his sexual limitations. Nevertheless, that was the situation at the time. That casts a little bit of light on what is going to take place in the future. As I say, this part also gives us a good physical and character description of Joseph, which the Bible doesn't always do. It, it doesn't take a whole paragraph to just describe the character and the physical appearance of someone. So it tells us that Joseph was handsome and intelligent. Uh, very rarely does the Bible mention about a person, whether they're beautiful or handsome. Sometimes women are mentioned as being beautiful, lovely of form, but rarely do they talk about men being handsome. Uh, he was a good administrator, trustworthy. He became successful and as far as a slave could, became independent. And he showed that he was a godly and spiritual man. So all of Joseph's good qualifications and good work were attributed to the presence of God in his life. The Bible says he was successful you know, because God was, was with him. Interestingly, the Egyptian was a pagan, so the fact that he realized that God was blessing Joseph was because Joseph must have given credit for his ability and success to God. You know, as uh, Harold always says, you know, the Lord has really blessed me. You know, well, in the church we know that, but perhaps other family and other people and neighbors have heard him say that, and they recognize that he at least believes that the Lord is blessing him with a large family and success and a nice home and so on and so forth because God is blessing him. So Joseph in the same way was giving credit to God for his success and that is why uh, Potiphar was uh, aware of his faith. So let's keep reading verse seven. It says, it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? As she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. Now for reasons made a little clearer by the fact that we know Potiphar was a eunuch, his wife, because of her desire of Joseph, uh, tried to have uh, sex with him. In other words, she was pursuing him. She was trying to seduce him. And we see Joseph deal with the situation, but he deals with it ineffectively. You know, he's not very effective in the way he's dealing with this situation. You know, he tries to reason with her by convincing her with the things that he is convinced of. In other words, you know, he's saying you know, it would be hurtful to her husband who's been so good to him. You know, he's saying, I can't do this to Potiphar. Look how good he's been to me. He's given me charge. You know, he's raised my profile, blah, 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 so on and so forth. I, I couldn't do this to him. And then he says, the other argument he uses is, well, it would be a sin against my God. I couldn't sin against my God in this way. But those were not very effective arguments with this woman. You know, the point here is that this woman doesn't really care about what her husband feels, does she? I mean, after all, she's trying to seduce a slave in her husband's own house. You know, it's, like, it's like bringing your, your, your adulterous partner into your own home to commit adultery. You know, I mean, that, that adds insult to injury. So she's not caring too much about her husband if she's ready to do this in her own uh, house. And she's a pagan. So arguments about God, you know, what, what effect will that have on her? She doesn't care about God, she doesn't even know who God is. So Joseph is, you know, at best, being naive here in thinking that reviewing his own reasons for avoiding sin will dissuade the one who is tempting him to sin. And you know, 
human nature, kind of like human nature, isn't it? Sometimes this is just a stalling tactic that we use just to hang around to take in the aroma of sin without taking a bite. You know? Just this once, maybe just a little bit, one time, what could it hurt really, you know, back and forth? A little bit like Eve. You know? uh, we stand around reviewing why we shouldn't do something instead of being proactive and simply rebuking the temptation and rebuking the tempter. So, of course, um, he was in a bad position because telling his master also might have gotten him killed. You know, what do you do? Well, what's the thing he didn't do? Well, the one thing he didn't do, we notice here in the, in the, in the story, is he didn't, he didn't appeal to God for help. You don't see him you know, go to his room and get on his knees and say, God, I, I'm in a bad place here. If I, if I tell the master, he might kill me. If I, if I, if I give in to her, uh, you know, I'll sin against you. What do I do? Help me. You know, he doesn't do any of that. He's trying to handle it on his own. A little bit like Eve. You know? she, she's kind of debating with the devil. So he's kind of debating with her about what, she, uh, what uh, he should do. So we keep going. Verse 11, it says, Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to me to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. So the seduction fails, and the wife is angry and, of course, humiliated. I mean, after all, she's the master's wife, she's trying to seduce him, so on and so forth. And the slave, imagine a slave says, no thank you. So she is humiliated and angry, and what does she do? Well, she cries rape, right? Now, the thrust of her attack, however, notice, is not that she may have been sexually attacked, but rather that a foreigner had such power in the household and thought that he could try something like this. She was more jealous of his influence on her husband than the fact that he you know, refused her. Because over and over again, she's saying, that Hebrew that you brought into this house, or that guy that you brought, you know what I'm saying? She's acute. It's like she's saying to her husband, this is your fault. You brought that guy in here and look what he did. Boy, talk about you know, boldness. You know, he, he thought he, could, he, he has so much influence that he actually thought he could come in here and you know, try to attack me in my own house. So she's, you know, she's less afraid about the sexual aspect and more angry about the, perhaps the loss of influence that she's had. I want you to note something else that's really interesting. Note that Potiphar's anger is kindled, is, is, you know, is kindled but it doesn't say that he was angry at Joseph. It just says he was angry, but it doesn't say he was angry at Joseph. I mean, think about it for a second. He is the chief executioner. <laughs> it's his job to put the prisoners to death. And this young man now has been accused of attacking his wife. The fact that Joseph wasn't killed and then ultimately rose to prominence in the prison suggests that Potiphar may have been angry about his wife's accusation and more annoyed in losing his right-hand man. <laughs> I've got this guy here, he takes care of everything for me, and now my wife has gone and accused him, you know, I got to do something. I mean, normally, uh, you know, 
Joseph would have been a dead man right there. He would have been, take him out and shoot him, you know? But no, he just puts him in jail. And you know that, we know the story, of course, you know, where Joseph rises to prominence in the jail, he becomes the right-hand man of the jailer, so on and so forth. So you're thinking, wait a minute, that could not have happened without Potiphar's okay. So it kind of, you, know, you read between the lines, you, you see what's going on, you see what's going on here. So as I said, had he been in a jealous rage, Joseph would have been dead. Instead, he was put in prison and still allowed a lot of freedom. Now, I'm not trying to minimize his suffering or the injustice of it all, but it does explain why he wasn't uh, executed. So let's read the last couple of verses here. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. So you know, kind of history repeats itself. Joseph, you know, the cream rises to the top, so to, so to speak. So Joseph demonstrates his great talents and the fact that God is blessing him. And the Bible shows that even though Joseph was gifted, it was God's blessings that made him prosper and not just Joseph's abilities. So let's keep reading the story. Now he's in jail. It says, then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them and he took care of them and they were in confinement for some time. So these men here were officers in the king's court. The cupbearer was responsible for the vineyards, for the wine service, also uh, food tasting. He was there to protect the king against poisoning. The baker, same idea, except he's responsible for the food preparation and service as well as the protection of the king. Now the fact that they were imprisoned and one subsequently was executed may seem that uh, there, you know, there was some sort of conspiracy going on here and the king had not finished his investigation as to who, you know, which, which person was guilty. So they, the, there was an investigation going on. In the meantime, both of them are in jail. So while the investigation is pending, both are in prison and both come in contact with Joseph. And the fact that Joseph served and saw to their needs says that they were well treated while the investigation went on. In other words, you never notice if you're poor and without work and you commit a crime, you go to jail and you know, you're doing a hard time. But if you're the president of a, of a big multinational corporation or something and you go to jail, well, you, sometimes you don't always go to that same jail. You go to a kind of a, a fancier jail you know, that it lo looks more like a, a camp you know, than, a, than a jail. Well, this is something like this here. You know, the high officials, you know, they're well treated while the investigation is going on. So let's keep reading. In five it says, Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? Then they said to him, We have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, do not, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So you know, Joseph had much experience with dreams, we know that, and especially uh, concerned uh, regarding the dreams which um, uh, had troubled them so much. He declares that God is the, uh, the interpreter of the dreams because, because dreams are usually about the future in the Bible. You know, we dream about things going on or if we had too much pizza before we went to bed, but in the Bible when they talk about dreams, they usually talk, you know, the dreams are usually a precursor of something is happening in the future and God knows the future. He controls time. Uh, so this is in, in essence why, why uh, Joseph is saying you know, uh, God is the one that interprets the dreams. And from this we also learn that Joseph was aware of his own ability to interpret dreams given to him by God. So we read about the, uh, what goes on. It says, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me and on the vine were three branches. 
and as it was budding, its blossoms came out and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup in Pharaoh, into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it, the three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. So the butler's dream is interpreted as a sign that in three days he'll be freed and he'll be restored to his old position. Now the fact that the branches gave grapes, which immediately presented to the king, showed that there was no tampering with the wine before it got to the pharaoh. That's the secret of the dream. In other words, the branches appeared, the grapes appeared, he took the grapes, squeezed them into the cup, gave the cup to the, uh, uh, to the king. It means from the, from, the, from the branches to the king, only the cup bearer you know, had chain of custody. You know, we hear that all the time, chain of custody. Only the cup bearer handled the grapes in the dream. All right? Now that's important because now we're going we're to read about um, uh, the next individual and his dream in verse, uh, in verse 16. Uh, it says, for I was in fact, oh I'm sorry, I forgot to read, for I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews and even here I have done nothing that uh, they should have put me into the dungeon. So uh, Joseph is explaining to the cup bearer why he wants to get out of, out of jail. All right, now we read about the baker. Now when the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top basket there were some of all sorts of baked food for the Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Then Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh off of you. Nice, uh, I guess he's, he must have said, man, I'm sorry I asked, you know, but anyway. So the baker, encouraged by the favorable interpretation of the butler, reveals his dream to Joseph. Now his dream also holds the clues to his downfall. There is no sequence where the preparation of the food and the service to the king are linked without interruption. In other words, there's a break in the chain of custody here, okay? And this suggests that anyone could have put the baked goods together. All right? And the fact that the birds come to eat some of the food says that the king did not get everything that was intended for him. In other words, there was interference there. The dream shows that there was interference between you know, the making of the food and the giving it uh, to the king. So the dream, if a reflection of the baker's work, showed that he had failed to guarantee the purity of the food and failed to protect it from its source to its destination. So we know that Joseph interprets the dream. He gives the bad news to the baker along with the fact that all of this will take place in three, uh, in three days. So you know, we, aside from this, we see you know, here's where God's power is seen in His ability not just to give meaning to images, but to be specific about future, about future events. So let's read verse 20 to 23. It says, Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all of his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office and he put the cup into the Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph has interpreted to them, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So it's the king's birthday, and along with the attending feast, you know, birthday parties, very ancient customs among all people, uh, this was an ideal opportunity to announce the results of the investigation. So with all the servants present, the king could make a good object lesson about the consequences of disloyalty or poor service. This is what happens to somebody who serves well, the cupbearer, and this is what happens to somebody who doesn't serve well, the baker. So the butler is restored and immediately takes up his former position. The baker, as Joseph predicted, is convicted and sentenced to die. So this should have really impressed the butler greatly but because of his new duties and perhaps the fear of competition from such a gifted man like Joseph, he kind of forgets or you know, 
accidentally on purpose forgets all about Joseph. Uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 41, a little later on, we find out that another two years goes by as Joseph languishes in prison before the butler remembers him and speaks to the Pharaoh on his behalf. And we'll pick up the story there uh, next time. So as we do uh, in these lessons, we kind of do some of the narrative, some of the story, and then maybe some practical lessons from this. So I want to share a couple of lessons from this, okay? Number one, your boss is watching you. <laughs> your boss is watching you. If you want to know what kind of Christian you are, ask your boss, because he or she is always watching you. You know, Joseph provided a tremendous witness for his faith to his slave masters because they, in their role as taskmasters, naturally observed not only what he did, but how he did it. You know, it should be quite evident to our superiors that we are Christians because of the quality of our work and also the attitude that we have in our work. For good or bad, in the sense that, you know, well, we're going to ask Joe over here you know, if, he's going to, if he's willing to you know, work uh, the next seven Sundays in a row. You know what I'm saying? And then the other supervisor will say, well, I don't know, I don't know about that. You know, you know, Joe is a churchgoer. You, know, you, you, you can go ahead and but I have a feeling you might have a problem getting him to make that kind of commitment. You know? Sometimes it's for negative and sometimes it's for positive. We need a trustworthy person, take over the account, so on and so forth. There are a lot of delicate things that are going to go on. We need someone we can trust with a large amount of money or so on. Hey, what about Joe? That, that guy, he's a straight arrow, you know, so on and so forth. They're always watching. They're always watching. Bosses usually like to hire Christians because they know that there's something different and better in Christian employees. And many times they are blessed because of them, because of the Christian employee, the boss is blessed. How do we know that? Well, we look at all stories here. Look at Joseph's story. It's a tremendous example of that, tremendous. So if you, can't convince, if you can't convince your boss that you're a Christian, you're going to have a hard time convincing anybody else. Because the boss is really, when I say the boss, your supervisor, whoever, whoever is over you in any capacity is, is, is watching you. All right. Lesson number two from this, run from temptation. Run, do not walk, run. You know, Joseph was young, he was cocky, he was ambitious, and he thought he could handle anything. I mean, after all, he survived the kidnapping. <laughs> but Satan is smarter and stronger than we are by ourselves. So when you hear or see a poisonous snake, what do you do? You don't tease it, you don't come play with it, you, know, you, you kind of get away from the thing. Now Joseph couldn't run, but he could have asked God for help, but he didn't and the evil of others overwhelmed him and hurt him. And I think that's the thing that a lot of times uh, young Christians or immature Christians or perhaps Christians that are too proud forget that evil can just overcome us. You know, we're not all that strong. We, we shouldn't get too close to something that's dangerous or something that we're easily drawn into because it can easily overwhelm us. Sometimes we can avoid sin, but we need to help avoid the schemes and the attacks of others against us. Remember, you know, Satan, you know, the Bible says it all, roams you know, the land looking for someone to devour. It doesn't say for someone to tempt. The end game is for someone to actually devour, to destroy. Okay? So a wise man runs away not only from personal temptation, but runs away from the appearance and the occasion of sin so that he can avoid it touching him, even indirectly. I, you know, I don't want it to touch me even indirectly. Because it's always, a, it's always a downer after. I don't know about you, but when I give in to my weakness, when I give in to sin, when I, you know, I'm saying in my mind, I'm not going to answer back, I'm, I'm going to handle this as a good Christian, and then I let myself go and say something, you know, I always regret it after. I was like, why did I do that? What? You know, I should have, should have, I should have, could have, would have, you know, but no, I, you know. And then the other one that, I mean, this whole story is that God is a slow cook. I couldn't figure out any other way to say this. You know. 
God is a slow cook. You know, the best food is usually cooked slowly to preserve the flavor and not you know, burn or dry up the ingredients. God is a slow cook because He takes all the time necessary to prepare people for certain works or certain service, certain ministry, or certain moments. You know, God will take 10 years to set you up for a thing that'll happen in 60 seconds for a critical decision or you know, a pivot, left or right, you know, he'll prepare you 10 years to, for that moment. You know, Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery and he was then 30 years old when he was made the head of Pharaoh's court. 13 years as a slave in Potiphar's house and in prison. 13 years, that's a long time. For something he didn't do, I mean, he was completely innocent. So it may have seemed to him like wasted time for this young, intelligent, talented man to spend 13 years as a prisoner. But if your life is dedicated to God and His service, there is no wasted time. He uses every moment to either perfect your holy character or prepare you for a specific ministry or point you towards a person or as I said, get you ready for your 60 seconds. To me it's amazing that you could live 80 years on this earth and your entire purpose, according to God, will have been used up in 60 seconds. <laughs> one decision you make, one thing you don't do or one thing you do, or you know, left or right, 60 seconds. He'll prepare you a lifetime just for 60, just for 60 seconds. And I uh, am a witness, I can witness this, and certainly the, the story of Joseph witnesses this, that God gives you back the wasted years. He promises unlimited time in heaven if we submit our time to Him and our purpose to Him here on earth. But I can also tell you that God gives back the wasted years. The years you wasted in not knowing Him or not serving Him after you finally decide, you know what, I'm leaving that behind. I'm going to serve the Lord with my whole heart, with my whole soul. You know, you really, I'm going to do this thing. And, and you're into it. Once you're in the service of the Lord, once you're totally in submission to Him, following the Spirit, everything back there seems as nothing. It's nothing because what he is giving you in the now replaces all of the bad stuff in the past. And you know, I, I only became a Christian when I was 30. I mean, that's a lot of years of living, you know what I'm saying? I lived as an adult for a long time before even knowing Christ and wasted a lot of that time. And yet I look back on it and it's as if, it's as if nothing. Everything that He's given me in Christ has, you know when they say a hundredfold, has replaced that time there, that wasted time, you know, has replaced it a hundred times, a hundred times over. And that's at no matter what point in life that you make that decision, He gives you back the wasted, the wasted years. Certainly He does for Joseph. Okay, so that's Joseph's, we're into the story, we're in the home stretch now, lesson 44. Uh, Joseph will be the last narrative in Genesis. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention for this lesson.